Hi, I'm Virginia. I'm Bianca. <laughs> and we are the identical twins from the dying movie race. Okay, so this week we're looking at the best supporting actress category, who we think should have taken home the gold. Um, and so we're going to start with 1936, which was the year it was first introduced. The nominees are Blue Bondi for The Gorgeous Hussy, Alice Brady for My Man Godfrey, Bonnie de Granville for These Three, Maria Ospenskaya for Dawsworth, and Gail Sondergaard for Anthony Adverse, who won. I'm going to give this to Bonita Granville for these three. I adore Bonita Granville, um, especially in her Nancy Drew persona, and this is the total opposite of that. But it's one r riveting performance. I mean, really, it's something that you really don't, like, when you think of Bonita Granville, you, you don't see her being, like, this evil, awful child. Um, but she, it's like Patty McCormick in the <laughs> bad seed. Like, that's what she's like. Um... And and so she totally um, really sends chills down your spine. And for Bonita Granville, nice sweet Bonita Granville, just as nice Austrian as she was on, to really put over this at such a young age, that's really impressive. Um, and I'm surprised she didn't win a juvenile Oscar. I mean, you know, I didn't have it yet, but they should have just because of her. Maybe they maybe they did after that. Maybe this was one of the reasons why they got one. I don't know. But yeah, that's my choice. <laughs> I am picking her as well. She steals these three and has amazing actors in it. But yeah, she's walks away with it. She's entertaining, but she's so sinister. And, you know, she does make you uncomfortable when she's on screen. The things she does in this movie is un are un some of the things are uncomfortable. But she is definitely just goes all out with it. And she has fun with it. And I think... I think if she wasn't a child, she would have easily won this year. I think if, for some reason, they decided to give the, a part like this to an older, like, actress who was maybe in her 20s or something, I think she would have won. But the fact that, you know, we have a child playing it, they didn't want to give the, this first Oscar statue, maybe even any other year, to a, a child. And it's still difficult for children to win Oscars. And, I mean... <laughs> well, I mean, Anna Paquin won for the piano, and Bonita Greenville, in my opinion, is better in these three than she is in the piano. Not to say that performance is bad, it's just Bonita's more of a standout in these three. So I think, you know, credit where credit is due, age doesn't matter. She should have won. And out of all the performances, she's the one that you're like, oh, that, that was a good one when you're reading down the list. You're like, oh, but that performance, that's the standout. Okay, 1937. The nominees were Alice Brady for In Old Chicago, who won, Andrea Leeds for Stage Door, Anne Shirley for Stella Dallas, Claire Trevor for Dead End, and Dame Mae Whitey for Night Must Fall. So those are, I could, any of them could have won. I would have been completely happy with any of them winning. These are amazing performances and all real standouts. I mean, they really knew who to pick this year. Um, I think I'm going to, and this might change, um, but I, I do want to go with Andrea Leeds for Stage Door. I've stated, I've written a blog about her, and I've stated that this is a really, a real standout performance, like Bonnie de Granville. Um, when I finished Stage Door, and when I first saw this, I was just getting started into movies. I was um, a young teenager when we first saw this, and I... And I walked away. I didn't know who Andrea Leeds was yet. And so I, I didn't walk away thinking of Kate. I didn't walk away thinking of Ginger. I walked away thinking of Andrea Leeds. And that one scene where she's going up the staircase trying to relive her um, best moment as an actress. Because like, she just, that's what she was born to be and whether people realize it or not. Um, and so it's kind of ironic that this was her best performance um, in her best role. And they really didn't follow it up. That's kind of silly on the studio's part. I mean, they really had a talent here and they didn't use it. And I think this is just, it, it, I think this one just really stands out because it's true on screen and true off screen of a great actress who was, whose talent didn't get the recognition it deserved. I'm picking her too, actually. Yeah, it, it, like you said, any, it's a year that whoever wins, you can't be mad. They're all great. But yeah, I think I'm gonna go with Andrea Leeds and Stage Door. It is mainly for that one scene. It's the scene of the movie, maybe, although Kate's uh, 
acting at the end of the movie, the Killer Lilies, that's a great scene too. But the, yeah, it's so moving and the way it's filmed is so interesting. But it's all on her face because she doesn't say anything. It's just her facial reactions and you know exactly what she's going to do when, when everything's happening. And it's... It, it, it could have been super over the top and it could have been like it could have been like you know valley of the dolls level like stupid melodramatic but it's not it's very um heartbreaking and you feel for her character and she's like i feel like you know you think a lot of like performances like oh she's the nice girl in the house you're like oh well that doesn't sound very interesting like that's not a part you would want to play oh no in this one it is because she gets some really juicy stuff to do and her and she may be nice but she's also ambitious so yeah it's it is a, actually an interesting perf uh, role to have and i think she pulls it off and like you said i'm really bummed she didn't do more because i think you know if this is a, a preview of what could have been it's really depressing that they didn't follow up on it 1938 the nominees are faye banter for jezebel who won Blue Labondi for Other Human Hearts, Billy Burke for Merrily We Live, Spring Byington for You Can't Take It With You, and Melissa Gorgeous for The Great Waltz. I would like to go with <laughs> Spring Byington for You Can't Take It With You. Everybody's great in this movie, um, especially the two male leads, Lionel Barrymore and Edward Arnold. And Spring Byington is such a joy in this film. Um, we watched this with our family, and they were all cracking up at everything she said. Um, and Spring Byington's always like this, and I think this is the essential Spring Byington role, like how she is so quirky and the you know scatterbrain but not in not as much as i guess you would say billy burke or else brady but close um to that while still having a tad bit of sanity left um and so she's really into writing plays and so when the cops come i just love how she's like she's so excited she's like this is just like a play so just moments like that really um really make the i mean the whole film's hilarious but i think she's really a standout of it yeah, I actually think I'm gonna go with her too. I know that's boring, but that we're picking the same people. And, but yeah, I mean, when they're all stacked together like that, and everyone gave uh, a lot of variety this this year, but you know, going with one of the comedic performances, and like you said, I think a big part of it is that we watched it with our extended family, and everybody thought she was hilarious. Like everything she said made people laugh, and um. Uh, I always remember watching the scene with our um, family where uh, it's the part where um, Jimmy Stewart's family, Edward Arnold and everybody are over their house and um, Spring Byington's trying to talk to them and she's like, well, don't you, and then she, what is it? Like, she's like, oh, don't you do anything? Oh, I mean something real, not something silly, not something <laughs> stupid. <laughs> like, And Edward Arnold's like trying not to laugh because he finds her funny <laughs> and, you know, showing that good side of him and i think and every during that scene i remember everyone laughing and then <laughs> like the way she said it and then Ronald's reaction and it won everybody over and like you said how she is eccentric and not like she's kooky but not in a uh, i guess you could call her like the cloud kooklander but she's not the um not in a way where you're like wow she's insane and she should be put away and like almost like the what you know way it could be in a sitcom where that character is endearing and you like to have them around and you know you know they're not annoying they're just eccentric 1939 a big year um so the nominees were olivia de Havilland for gone with the wind geraldine fitzgerald for weathering heights hattie mcdaniel for gone with the wind who won edna may oliver for drums along the mohawk and maria ospenskaya for love affair another great group um, and Edna Mae Oliver is one of my all-time favorite character actresses. How do I love thee? Um, but I, I'm going to agree with the winner, Hattie McDaniel. Um, it's not an easy part to stand out, especially when you're with the larger-than-life Vivian Lee in this film, who we picked, both picked to win, be agreed, should have won Best Actress. Um, but Hattie McDaniel more than lives up to her supporting role. Um, she knows, um, when, t when to, um be um sort of um sassy and she knows when to be understanding and um a lot of the films um more lighthearted moments come from her i think um and 
every scene she's in, you, you, your eyes go to her. Um, in this once in a lifetime cast, um, you really um, see Hattie, and this is what really made her a big character actress. So that's really saying something. This year, I'm definitely between Hattie and and then me, Oliver, and uh, that's it. That's tough to pick between because they both steal every scene they're in. Oof, they I think, do. yeah, they always do. You're right. I think I'm going to go with and the male over just by a little bit, and I think that's um, I don't know, maybe because uh, the whole slave thing and going with the one's a little uncomfortable, and that's not Hattie's fault, but it's just you kind of you can't help but think about that watching it. Oh, they're kind of caricatures, and granted, she plays it really well and she goes you know all out for it, but yeah. And that's whereas that you obviously and the Mae Oliver's part isn't like that, and it was just I mean the movie in general is a lot of fun yeah. and she amplifies that fun like as much as she can she plays the part for all she's all it's worth every scene she's on and she's giving it one hundred percent and there's like this I love the scene where um she loves her her bed which is like the bed she shared with like her dead husband or something and she won't mm -hmm. um, yeah. get rid of it and the part the uh, there are these parts where these native americans come to burn down her house and she's in a room and she and she's not even like afraid of them she's like well i'm not leaving without my bed and they're like well the house is gonna burn down you're gonna have to leave and she's like nope not without my bed and so they all carry her out on her bed and she's like yelling at them and everything and it's hilarious <laughs> it's so funny and i mean I, you know you can watch this character forever and i think that um a part like that the part that, a part that leaves you wanting more and a performance that leaves you you know begging for more is fantastic and it may all for always is like that no matter what she's playing you always want to yeah to follow her around and you're always like why is it like can't she be the lead because you know she's just so entertaining and movies where she was the lead are a lot of fun so but and maybe it's just because we're both fans and we like her and everything but yeah she's my pick for that year 1940 another great group um the nominees were judith anderson for rebecca jane darwell for the grapes of wrath who won Ruth Hussey for The Philadelphia Story, Barbara O'Neill for All This in Heaven 2, and Marjorie Rimbaud for Primrose Path. Um, I will go with Judith Anderson for Rebecca. I mean, I adore The Grapes of Wrath. Um, maybe more than I guess a lot of people do because people are like, it's sad. <laughs> um, I, I, I love that movie. But Rebecca is one of my all-time favorite movies. And um, Judith Anderson is um, is the definition of a scene-stealing um, actress in this film. Um, and a lot of the film's tension is on her because the real int the antagonist of Rebecca is dead and we don't see her. Um, so all of the film's um, tension has to come from her and oh boy does it. Um, she and sh she never smiles. Um, it just really um, adds so much to this character from um, such a great actress who's so versatile and uh, wonderful in everything she's in and this is probably her best performance on the screen so that's really saying something i'm picking her too jane darwell's definitely the runner-up but um and again it's it's tough picking between the two of them but yeah i agree you gotta go with um judith anderson this year and i think that it's a performance that could have come across like dead on screen because she is so emotionless and she um is creepy and it could have just been like a a kind of one note performance but it it almost calls for that but it's not with Judith Anderson she play she has this sort of um this mysterious quality to her but in a way that um allows the audience to connect the dots it's almost like we're getting something that uh between her and Rebecca that the movie isn't telling us and that the other characters don't understand like this bond that they have that's all done for Judith Anderson and the um when she's you know going closer and closer to madness it's she still is never over the top she still is in her character and she still you know seems calm but has that um very um dark side to her that's really disturbing and that really is the sinister force of Rebecca. It's not so, 
like you could say it's Rebecca Beyond the Grave, but Rebecca Beyond the Grave lives through um, Judith Anderson as Mrs. Danvers, and that is scary. And uh, I think everybody thinks of the scene where she tries to make Joan Fontaine commit suicide, and the scene where she takes her into Rebecca's room, and she knows Rebecca's room like a map. It is creepy. But, you know, those scenes are classics for a reason, and I think it's because these two actresses are so perfect for their parts. 1941, the nominees are Sarah Allgood for How Green Was My Valley, Mary Astor, who won for The Great Lie, Patricia Collins for The Little Foxes, Teresa Wright for The Little Foxes, and Margaret Richley for Sergeant York. Yeah, I know, that's <laughs> hard to decide. Um, I, I want to go with Patricia Collins in Little Foxes. Um, she plays Birdie, um, and this was her screen debut, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's a fantastic performance. It's really hard to picture anybody else in this role, actually. Um, a lot of the other parts that you hear about people having, you're like, oh, I guess I could see that. But with, with Birdie, I'm like, oh, no, no, this is, like, this is who she... Like, this is Birdie. Like, who, who else can compete with this performance? Um, and she's such a pathetic little creature. Um, she just, she's broken. It's really depressing seeing her. And yet she's an incredibly nice woman. Um, and she's nice to people who don't deserve her kindness. Her um, her husband and her son, played by the great Dan Derrier, <laughs> they um, completely abuse her. And the only person that's nice to her is Herbert Marshall. Um, the, the person who everybody else isn't nice to, her, who her whole family isn't nice to, they're in the same boat. And so little moments like that just really, um, really uh, make this um, character and you, you are very interested in her. You really do care about her, even though you know that she's doomed. I'm going to go with her as well. And I think that, like you said, the character of Birdie in general is interesting. And it's a very sad part. And I remember the first time seeing The Little Foxes, the part stuck with me and the way she played it. Especially the scene, and I think everybody thinks of this scene when we think of her performance in it, when she talks about how she hates her son mm -hmm. and that she can't help it. And her son's an asshole, I don't blame her, but mm -hmm. you know how awful it is that she's a mother and she hates her own son and it makes her sad and really emotional. But it, it's also... the really the only time in the movie we let her see her emotions take hold of her because she is abused so much that she is a shell of a person and the fact that and we also know it's okay to like her because Herbert Marshall is she's the only one in the family Herbert Marshall likes besides his own daughter and that shows that oh yeah she is the best person of the lot and we should and we are it's okay to feel bad for her and it's okay to um you know hold it against the rest of the family that she is the way she is and it's really really sad but it's also um it's also fascinating. yeah fascinating and entertaining even you're not like oh birdie's coming on screen oh boy this is gonna be depressing you're like oh yay this is gonna be interesting it's gonna be fascinating 1942 and the nominees were Gladys Cooper for Now Voyager, Agnes Moorhead for The Magnificent Ambersons, Susan Peters for Random Harvest, Dame Whitey for Mrs. Miniver, and the winner, Teresa Wright for Mrs. Miniver. <clears throat> Those are wonderful movies. I mean, I, I adore all these movies, too. Um, I will go with Gladys Cooper for Now Voyager. Um, it, this is a part that really gets me angry watching it because you know you know someone plays a good villain when they get you angry no matter how many times you've seen this movie you're like oh my god you're just an awful person you want to jump on the screen and punch him <laughs> this old lady you want to go and punch her because that's how awful she is um, and Gladys Cooper is just really really um, making this character just as loathsome as she can be um, and she's um, this controlling manipulative mother who um has no emotion no love for her daughter and only can make those around her depressed and so when her daughter betty davis finally stands up to her 
you know, you're proud, but it's a hard thing to do. It takes her a while to actually do it. Um, and, but you understand no, and just the whole movie, you're like, Oh, come on, stand up to your mother, stand up to your mother. Like that's the journey here. She, it's not her becoming beautiful. It is her finding love, but it's because of that love that she's able to stand up to her mother. That's the real conflict here. So it's just moments like that, that make this film one of the finest romances because it offers more than just a romance. I'm going with her as well this year, and I think Gladys Cooper is definitely one of the best actresses who could play a domineering yeah. mother. She did so a couple times, and she's always, you know, nails it on the head every time. It's, and like like you said, the performance is so, oh my, like, I mean, it's a villainous performance. It's like, um, uh, she's like the, uh, the evil stepmother in Cinderella, and the way she portrays it. But, like, how she's that controlling and that manipulative and that um, off-putting that she uh, lives in this own little world and she makes her daughter live in it with her, even though why should her daughter have to suffer with her? It's not her problem, but it she makes it her problem so she doesn't have to be alone. And she just whines throughout the whole movie and everything she does bothers you like as a viewer you're like can't, oh can you please just leave her and you understand why she can because mentally it's difficult for her too because she was brought up like this but it's also uh, like how she every chance of happiness her daughter gets she shoots it down every time she has a chance to break away from this life Oh, there's, there's the mother, and there's Gladys Cooper being as evil as can be, and it's, uh, yeah, it's not, it is a villainous performance, yet it's not, and it's, uh, it's one that, um, it feels more than just a one-dimensional bland villainous performance in Gladys Cooper's hands. 1943. Okay, the nominees are Gladys Cooper for The Song of Bernadette. <laughs> Polly Goddard for So Proudly We Hail, Katina Paxino, who won for For Whom the Bell Tolls, Anne Revere for The Song of Bernadette, and Lucille Watson for Watch on the Rhine. Um, and so, once again, I'm going with Gladys Cooper. She's okay, okay she's a great actress, guys. Um, in The Song of Bernadette, um, we said, you know, it's the supporting cast that really stood out to us, along with the score and the set in the scenery. Um, and, um, well, the whole supporting cast, I mean, Charles Bickford and Anne Revere as well, they're fantastic, but, um, and obviously Vincent Price, who was not nominated, unfortunately, and he should have been, and we'll say, we'll keep saying that, <laughs> but Gladys Cooper is also one who stuck with my mind. I remember after I saw it, I said to Virginia, Gladys Cooper in that scene, you know, like, yeah, we just could we had to talk about that scene along with the Vincent Price scene. Um, she's not in very much of the movie, um, but what, but, oh boy, like, that, you're like, there's other people around when Gladys Cooper's on the screen? I did not know, because I'm, I just care about Gladys Cooper, because she's, um, a nun, but she's judgmental, which is some, that's a no-no, um, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's a scene. Yeah, exactly, like, you know, when you think of nuns, you think judgmental, <laughs> um, and so she, um, because she thinks she's jealous of Jennifer Jones's Bernadette, she thinks, why does she get to see the Virgin Mary while I, who devoted my whole life to this for how many years, doesn't get to see anything? Like, what does she sacrifice? I sacrificed my youth, my life. And then um, she finds out how wrong she was um, when Bernadette shows that she's been suffering from an illness that's unbearably painful. And so there's that scene where she runs out to her um, cathedral and begs for forgiveness and just that moment I was like oh my god what a character and what a performance oh, this year is tough <laughs> um, I'm between Gladys Cooper and Lucille Watson because they both play similar parts yeah. they play characters that seem one dimensional on the surface but really are not they really have these depths and these um, this kindness to them that you don't see from like until the movie makes a turning point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I already picked Gladys Cooper. I'll pick Lucille Watson, I guess. Uh, and to me, like how we say, um, watch on the Rhine. It's interesting how it, in a movie that stars Betty Davis, it, you, everyone else in the movie sticks in your mind, and. 
I think that after Paul Lucas, I'd say Lucille Watson is the yeah. one that sticks out after him. You agree? Yeah. It's, I think, and again, because the character's interesting, how she is rich, and you think that she's not very smart, mm -hmm. and that she's not, um, that, how can she comprehend the, the problems that Paul and Betty went through in Europe, and the issues of war, like, that's far from this character as can possibly be in her mind. But, of course, we realize it's not really like that, that she can comprehend the struggles they're going through, and that she can extend a hand to help them, and that she does care, and that she's not this, like, stupid old woman like we thought she was, that, like, is frivolous in her, in her own life, that she, there's way more to her than you think. And she's never unlikable, you just think she's ignorant. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, they could have made her um, ignorant in almost an unlikable way, but they don't, and I think that's interesting. Is that you're just like, you just think that she's just sort of this distant person who means well, but you know doesn't understand the grasp of things, and maybe she never will. But that's okay. She's still willing to help, and I think it's a performance that she plays very well, and she does both aspects very well. Nineteen forty-four. The nominees are Ethel Barrymore for None But the Lonely Heart, who won. Angela Lansbury for Gaslight, Aline McMahon for Dragon Seed, Jennifer Jones for Since You Went Away, and Agnes Moorhead for Mrs. Parkington. And I'm going to go with Agnes Moorhead for Mrs. Parkington. It's um, shocking to me that Agnes Moorhead never won an Oscar. I mean, <laughs> it, it, she's memorable in everything she does. <laughs> um, she's funny. She's um, one of the finest dramatic actresses, to be sure. Um, and in Mrs. Parkington, she, um, I think she's having a lot of fun making this movie. I think everybody is. Um, that's the magic of Garson and Pigeon, um, and she really does steal all her scenes as the, lo and this could have been a part that was really boring, she's their longtime friend, you know, she's always just there to provide a wisecrack in her typical Agnes Moorhead way, and she's, um, secretly in love with Walter Pigeon, but she never says it, um, she, cause she loves Greer Garson, you know, she, um, she's her best friend, so obviously she's not gonna be like, hey, I love your husband, yet you could tell, um, and even though Greg Garson brings it up later, you can tell even before then. So um, it's really a quietly effective performance that also has a bit mo some moments that are lively. So I think this is really on um, Agnes Moorhead at what she does best. Yeah, I'm probably between Agnes and Ethel this year. But, and I was gonna go with Ethel, but the more I thought about it, Agnes has more to do in Mrs. Parkinson, because Ethel has to just be very dramatic, and none but the only heart, where Agnes Moorhead has to be funny, and she has to be serious, and she has to be stand out next to Walter Pigeon and Greer Garson, like, who can do that? <laughs> yeah, she can. And I think it's also because the character in itself is interesting, how she could have, it could have been this, um, you know, stupid love triangle like one-sided love triangle that you know sometimes when you see that in movies you're like are we doing this again i'm sick of seeing this but here because it's not really shown in a dramatic light it's more acceptable and because her part like she doesn't like seem like morbidly depressed by it at all and i think that makes a difference like she, her life is not run by this like possible love triangle and because she does care for Greer Garson and she does care for Walter Pigeon and she does like that they're happy together and she accepts that and so she's never a threat she's always more the friend and a comfort and her presence becomes a comfort because at first when you see I remember when I saw this movie when she first entered the screen I'm like we're doing this this <laughs> plot really like right now at this point in the movie <laughs> okay but it didn't do that and I was happy it didn't and I was happy that they made this a three-dimensional character and not just a you know that bitch that's g m might get in the way of things you know might screw <laughs> things up <laughs> I'm sick of seeing that performance you know it's okay sometimes and some actresses have fun with it but it's a trope that is tired at best and this movie avoids it and makes what could have been a hackneyed situation into a good character th uh, moment yeah it's very refreshing yeah. okay 1945 the nominees were eve arden for mildred pierce and blythe for mildred pierce angela lansbury for the picture of dorian gray joan loring for the corner screen and the winner and revere for national velvet 
I'm going to go with Anne Bly and Mildred Pierce. In my opinion, she equals Crawford in this film. This film works because both of them are so good. And honey, I didn't know you had it in you. This I'm um, sorry because you're always in these, um, she's always in these charming comedies and she's a wonderful singer. So you, naturally you don't think, let's have her play a bitch. Because, <laughs> you know, because that, that's the last thing you look at when you see um, Anne Bly. You don't, th like, you think this is the sweetest girl ever. Um, <laughs> and so I think that really adds to the character. Um, because she is, um, it's the classic femme fatale she looks so sweet on the outside but on the inside she is nothing but oh, she's so hard um and she treats her mother Joan Crawford who does everything for her she treats her like a slave I mean that she works for her like everything that she has to sacrifice has to be for her and she won't stop until she has the best and even when she gets the best she doesn't want it um so just seeing um this delightfully um Bra this delightfully bratty character is really um <laughs> it's really entertaining to watch these two women um and their moments together the classic scene where she throws her out like before i throw the your clothes out and you with them um is um great because just the both of them just bouncing off each other um it's really a treasure of film noir and these two ladies are fighting and it's not campy at all it's just a mother and a daughter fighting um and it's a daughter who's a brat and a bitch and a mother who is nothing but nice so it's really just two characters and this movie works because of these two women i gotta go with Anne blythe too i like i love this performance the same reason i love bunny to greenville mm -hmm. in um these three that she's normally such a bright likable actress and here she is very she just is not like that at all. She seems like it on the surface, maybe when you first put the movie in, but then it doesn't take long to realize that it's not like that at all. And I think that it's, it, again, the way, like you said, the way the two actresses bounce off each other because the movie is these two, these two characters and these two actresses and uh, how they, how, the mother is so self-sacrificing and she loves her daughter even though the daughter doesn't deserve it and she has nothing to earn it she just it's just she's her daughter she loves her and she can't help it but yet there is and again she seems sweet at first and to like all these characters that first meet her they fall for her spell like the classic femme fatale but then but she does show her true colors and she has these really nasty scenes that are very memorable like she marries somebody just for some you know money so that they could pay for her, so that they could pay her out of um out of the marriage to get an annulment and she that's the only reason why she did it she's like yeah i wanted the money could have been um just both actresses worked very well off screen together and they were lifelong friends and you and maybe in the movie you can't tell that they got along so well but you can tell that there's not this like competition between them that there's a harmony going on in their acting and the way they're clashing together and it's because i feel like most pe actresses who would play um vera would want to outdo the mother because they feel like Vita, sorry, because they feel like she would want to do that, but Anne Blythe is happy complimenting Joan Crawford because she knows that that's not how Mildred would have it, and I think that is, um, and it just adds extra layers to this bitchy character. The nominees are Ethel Barrymore for The Spiral Staircase. Anne Baxter for The Razor's Edge, Lillian Gish for Duel in the Sun, Flor, Ro Flor Robeson for Saratoga Trunk, and Gail Sondergaard for Anna and the King of Siam. And I'm going to group the winner, Anne Baxter, in The Razor's Edge. Um, this is, um, she clearly won for one scene, but oh boy, um, this is a scene that a lot of the other actresses who were nominated in the Best Supporting Actress category in a lot of years, you know, they don't have this one scene really that puts them over. Um, two scenes, yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, and I read this book. Um, it's a great book, and I and this character is really brought to life on screen because um in the book it's more of she's more of the side than what you think of her as in the movie. Um, and um, and it must not have been easy put, like 
playing this character because she become first she's the sweetest little girl she's so much in love oh my god she's so happy then she loses everything and becomes an alcoholic so it's um quite a jolt quite a whiplash of a character here and that's kind of the point is she's not recognizable anymore but the scene where she finds out she's lost her husband and her child um is heartbreaking um that's when i think of this movie actually this is the first scene i think of um and uh she said that she um was crying because she was recalling the memory of her brother dying um i believe when she did this if i'm not mistaken um and you and oh boy is this method acting i mean if you really believe this woman's lost everything she's freaking out um screaming um and gets hysterical but not like again not a campy sense like you just really your heart goes out to her and for the rest of the movie she never gets herself back and so it's a really tragic story i'm gonna pick her as well and like you said when i think of the razor's edge i do think of like her two standout scenes before i think of a lot of the other parts in the movie um and i think it's because it's such an acting tour de force and it's a very um it is a very heavy part and it, it, it's interesting and it's great that they got ambassador to do it she definitely can handle pretty much anything thrown away that she could do all types of genres and she could overplay it she could underplay it she could do whatever the director requests of her and here she has to play somebody whose life is in ruins almost in that sort of whiplash kind of like the whiplash we see in other actresses we talked about um in the previous weeks like helen hayes and sid and maylon cloday how she starts off innocent and happy and then crashes down and she's unrecognizable at the end this performance is basically a lot like that it the only difference is she's lost she has no hope left because she's lost people to death whereas um helen hayes and cinema maylon cloday there's her son's out there somewhere so there's a little bit of hope with her she lost everything with ann baxter and so she ha so she's completely in ruin she has no reason to live and so she completely throws herself into this um cesspool of you know disgust that the characters happen to come across her like they don't know she's there they just happen to be there and well there she is and she looks she looks you know very down and very um out of it and it's it's so shocking that the last time we saw her she was you know in tears and now we see her and she's a completely different person 1947 the nominees were ethel barrymore for the paradigm case gloria graham for crossfire celeste holm who won for gentlemen's agreement marjorie main for the egg and i and anne revere in gentlemen's agreement i'm gonna go with ethel barrymore in the paradigm case she's really not in a lot of this movie she's probably in five minutes if that um and so it probably seems odd that i'm gonna pick her and you know i didn't pick her for i'm done but the lonely heart but um and the paradigm case is one of those movies that is really talky and i love courtroom dramas but this one doesn't really have as much interest as they usually do it's exquisitely directed but the plot and the characters are kind of just um they're okay um thanks david o selznick <laughs> yeah that's david o selznick's fault not alfred hitchcock's well, he wrote it so yeah i know i know yeah. he did <laughs> i know yeah. he did i trust me i saw his name because yeah. <laughs> don't worry he doesn't he let you forget that <laughs> yeah. but like i remember after you saw this if you don't mind me saying i yeah. remember after you saw this you mentioned to me you said ethel barrymore should have been in this more you said the direction was great the script was annoying but ethel should have been should have been in this movie more oh boy should he should she have she should have been the main character if this movie was about her uh it, i would i'd be like this is an amazing movie everybody go see it, if it talks so much. <laughs> she could keep talking um yeah <laughs> because uh, see this is the effect that ethel barrymore has in this film um <laughs> she and she oh boy she underplays this part to perfection um it really is perfection <laughs> um because she's married to charles lawton and he's an asshole he's a philanderer and she is completely unhappy and maybe slightly losing her mind a little bit but in only the um the smallest sense like it's not an over-the-top thing like there's this just the final scene where you see her they're having dinner together and they're like not talking they're not communicating there's no love in this relationship whatsoever and I think she like spills wine on herself or something and he just is like oh go clean it up and so and you just know that 
there's nothing these two characters have for each other. And just the way she reacts, and she doesn't say anything, but you just see just dead inside. And yet such a lively performance in in some way with her eyes. This is a real, real standout. Um, and it's funny that the sound this like two hour long movie is this performance I was in it for like five minutes. I want to know how the colonel got out of the barrel. That's what it reminds. <laughs> that's what it reminds me. I'm sorry. I love that. Yeah, heaven can wait. Reference. Um. Anyway, <laughs> you weren't expecting that. Now were you? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna pick Celeste home for Gentleman's Agreement. She did win for this. It's difficult picking her because she and Anne Ruby are both really good in this movie, so it's difficult to kind of pick a between them. But I do think that in this performance, that's a lot of talk and a lot of acting. I do think she probably is a standout because she plays this. Um, and Celeste played a couple parts like this afterwards. It's almost like people were like, oh, oh, good, we found her niche. And so she continued playing these um, wise, uh, like, career-heavy women. And I think I actually feel bad for her character in this yeah. because we find out she likes Gregory Peck and he does not. What does she see in him? <laughs> I wonder, yeah, what what can she possibly see in such a beautiful man? <laughs> but I think that it's because you're one, because she's the tolerant one and she's the smart one so you're like, well, okay, why can't, uh, why can't she get she's somebody? Well, John Garfield's married. Yeah, no, but I mean, she's always hanging out with Yeah, him, you're right. She, pick, with him. she picks, yeah. She definitely h hangs around men who are t who yeah. are called, who are taken for. Find a girl who could be friends with your friends. <laughs> Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that, I mean, I guess you can argue that uh, making her attracted to Gregory Peck kind of um, makes her character more love-struck, and that's not the way she is shown throughout the movie she's more um strong and more independent and i think and throwing that into it you can argue well you know she doesn't have to be in love with him why do why do you have to complicate things with that why can't she just be this tolerant woman who like enjoys hanging out with people because she's the type of person people want to have a conversation mm -hmm. with and i think that this, it's interesting, it's also interesting this character is in support because I fe feel like in a lot of women's pictures she would be the lead because be played by Betty Davis. Yeah, she'd be played by Betty Davis. Yeah. <laughs> she'd be played by, you know, Barbara Stanwyck yeah. or somebody and Rosal Russell. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that it's because there are extra lyrics to this character that aren't necessarily in the film but we get it through Celeste's performance mm -hmm. because she adds these layers because she seems like a fun woman and she does seem interesting she does seem like someone you want to have over to a party and have a conversation mm -hmm. with and i think that uh she does again it's a adding the whole love thing does complicate it just a little bit but i do she does throughout the movie at least keep it consistent because you do t you can tell she likes him but she at least is still able to be his friend and to accept that. Like Agnes Moorhead. Like Agnes Moorhead, yes. Kind of like that, except Agnes does not have that little confession. Yeah. <laughs> Ag Agnes is more um, cool with it, but yeah. 1948, the nominees are Barbara Bel Geddes for I Remember Mama, Ellen Corby for I Remember Mama, Agnes Moorhead for Johnny Belinda, Gene Simmons for Hamlet, and the winner, Claire Trevor, for Key Largo. And I know I picked everyone for Johnny Belinda, um, and you said to me, are you going to pick Agnes Moorhead? Um, I, well, sorry, I mean, I already picked her, so it's not so bad. But I, I have to agree with the winner, Claire Trevor. She has, Agnes has her imaginary Oscar people. <laughs> 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 but I, I agree with the winner, Claire Trevor. Um, don't we love her? Uh, she is quite the scene stealer, as she always is in this film. Um, there's just such delicious moments from her as Edward G. Robinson's mall, drunken mall, um, and he degrades her to no end for her alcoholism. And one part she has, to, um, probably the part that since showed this Oscar, she has to sing for a drink, and so she sings the tone deaf, like moaning low. <laughs> it's so tone deaf, and it's so 
embarrassing and everybody just stares at her like oh god this woman like has no self-respect she's singing awful she's singing like like a I don't know like she's squawking yeah. for this drink um so it's just such a and but you feel you feel bad for her, even though she's the villain's mall like you, it's moments like that you really see that this girl like she has like it's like Ethel Barrett when you know, she has nothing like um all she has is that drink like why do you think she drinks so um I just love Claire Trevor in anything and especially this movie I'm picking Claire too for Key Largo. It's um, it's definitely uh with uh in a film that is with brilliant actors and actresses, mm -hmm. she is probably the standout, and that's saying something. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because she has her character is something that um commands the screen because she's so um down in the dumps and she's so you know out of it because she's at this alcoholic mall. And like you said, this the scene that probably got her the Oscar where she has to sing. It's um, and she's think and she's singing against her own wishes, but yet she does it because she wants that drink. And it's so uncomfortable, and the song sounds so off key. You want to crawl under your chair when you're watching it because it's so uncomfortable and cringeworthy. And um, it's. It is, I feel like it's the type of part that could have been, um, kind, it could have just had, the part could have just had that one scene, but then throughout the rest of the movie been, um, in the background because we would have been paying attention to Bogart and Robinson and all these great actors and, you know, the tension in this, um, hostage movie because that's always a tension packed filled movie where we're, um, watching all the, just the tension fly off the screen and the fireworks, you know, burst. But yeah, we, there is something about Claire Trevor that she does keep the, f she is able to keep focus on her, and she is for all this tension able to hold the audience's attention as well, and that we do always have our eye on her when she's on screen. Okay, 1949. The nominees are Ethel Barrymore for Pinky, Celeste Holm for Come to the Stable. Elsa Lanchester for Come to the Stable, Mercedes McCambridge for All the King's Men, and Ethel Waters for Pinky. Mercedes McCambridge won, by the way, I didn't mention that. Um, I'm going to go with Ethel Waters for Pinky, um, and I guess today Ethel Waters is mostly known as a singer, even though she acted a lot, but it was mostly on stage, so I guess we tend to forget that, but we still have her records. Um, and she did play parts quite a lot like this from Pinky real dramas. I mean, she like even though she was a musical, she was was an often musical comedy. Yeah, like Member of the Wedding, like you said, um, Mamba's Daughters, things like that. Um, so she's and she's a great dramatic actress. Um, and she doesn't sing in this at all. Um, that should be noted. Uh, and 1949 was an interesting year for films of um, racial tolerance because you had this and then you had Lost Boundaries and Intruder in the Dust, um, Home of the Brave, all these movies. Um, and and so this is a really impressive year um, in terms of that. And Ethel Waters with Pinky, um, you look at Hattie McDaniel, um, quite a stereotype, um, but still just as um steen stealing as ever and then you look at ethel waters and pinky not at all a stereotype um like you know they um african-american actors often said they had to put on a voice that they didn't use in real life life uh, um ethel waters doesn't do that here she often didn't um because we know ethel waters doesn't sound like that um i think people knew by then um but in pinky she has complete dignity even though they're living in poverty um she is a dignified woman she has class um and she really um stands up for jean crane the um the light-skinned african-american girl um and she's um she's not um it reminds me of juanita Moore in imitation of life J again the dignity and the understanding she has for a girl whose um situation she can't relate to but she is still um just a strong presence and i think this is um really a standout of the film it needs a, that strong presence to really make it credible it needs it from an african-american actor ethel would probably be my runner-up i'm going with the winner mercedes mccambridge i think that 
it, it, it is interesting because I think that um, Willie Stark, Br uh, Broderick Crawford's character is so large in life and takes up every scene he's in because he has to play this big, you know, Huey Long type of character. Yet, um, Mercedes McCambridge is able to stand alongside him and she is able to command a scene because she's a lot like him. She's larger than life and she, um, you know, is... Th she likes the thrill of the um, political arena, and she likes um, her job, and she <laughs> she likes Willie. <laughs> that's definitely that's definitely part of it, and I think that um, it's because it is funny because she does get a lot of screen time to the point where she does almost feel like a lead, Be and as does John Ireland because he's telling the story and. Yeah, yeah, it feels like all three of them are kind of the lead in this, rather than just one lead, but obviously the story's about Willie, so Willie's the lead. Anyway, um, her her part is um, very ambitious, very, and the fact that she, but yet she does, she's not like sleeping to get to the top, she literally does like Willie, but yet she does, she is ambitious and she likes her job and she that's a big part of it too and that might be what attracts her to you know a, a politician no matter how dark, bad he is personally and I think that um it, it's kind of like um Faye Dunaway's performance in, that, in Network another Oscar winning performance which is a very ambitious performance but one that also is built around sexual lust and it, it, it's like a precursor to that and and that is a great performance and it's it, it, it is like that and she does play it kind of similar to that but a little bit more um she wears her ambitions probably a little bit more on her sleeve 1950 we have hope emerson for caged celeste home for all about eve the winner josephine hutchins Josephine Hall, not Josephine Hutchinson, <laughs> another actress. Josephine Hall for Harvey, Nancy. Miscast. <laughs> yeah, she would have been miscast. But I could kind of see it. Nancy Olson in Sunset Boulevard, and Thelma Ritter for All About Eve. Um, I'm gonna go. I mean, those are wonderful ladies in wonderful movies. I want to go with Hope Emerson for Caged. Um, again, I, I go with a lot of villains here. Um, but um, I guess there's something about um uh. Bad a bad woman yeah. <laughs> when you can really take that scene because again like i said this is like gladys cooper you just really want to go in and punch this woman she's an awful woman there's nothing about her that's kind um she's a warden and she abuses her power and you normally see men play these parts so it's nice to see a woman play this part and you would see it's more after this like i lipino a woman's prison but this is really kind of like the first woman you really see in this role and there were b more before but i mean this is like the big one here um and there's a lot of moments of her being a sadist like her cutting off the hair of eleanor parker that's um, a heartbreaking scene um moments like that and when she's flaunting that she has a date in front of the girls because they don't have any men i mean who does that <laughs> um they haven't seen a man in god knows how long and she's flaunting that she has a date um it, even though she knows they all hate her and they don't want to hear about her damn date um so it's but she um and she plays it quite stoic it's very interesting because hope emerson often steals her scenes um and she could either be very stoic or not um so it's kind of um so it's very darkly evil um very understated i'm gonna go with hope as well and it's caged is a, um, a movie that a lot of the movie um, is you put like revolves around you hating this character and oh boy do you mm -hmm. it's like you it, it gets to the point where she does get it inevitably mm -hmm. as these characters always do and when they always do you don't want to you like you feel like the human side of you is gone as a viewer so you are like oh can't they just get it mm -hmm. and when they do it's uh, satisfying yet you feel bad about it because you're like well okay that that's weird that i'm rooting for somebody to somebody to die but that's how awful this character is it's um and it is the um typical ruthless um prison guard but yet it's a woman and yet it's just as vicious and um sadistic and violent as someone like hugh and corona yeah. and uh brute force and i think that 
it's one that the movie in general shows oh just because these are women does in prison it doesn't mean they don't go through the same issues men go through in prison that we see in male prison center movies and that the same is with hope hemerson's character and she the way she controls these girls and she uses them to get what she wants and she runs she runs the house like a gang lord it's it, yet she does it so stoically like as if oh no this is my normal life and i like that <laughs> and she doesn't play this like hammy over the top villainous she just plays it like this is who she is and like you said the scene where she rubs it in about having a date she does it she does it stoically she doesn't i feel like a lot of actresses would have been like i have a date Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah she's just like oh no have a date (laughs) and it just makes you it makes her because she is a sadist so she is emotionless and it definitely um heightens that 1951 the nominees are Joan Blondell for The Blue Veil, Mildred Dunnick for Death of a Salesman, Lee Grant for Detective Story, the winner Kim Hunter for A Streetcar Named Desire, and Thelma Ritter for The Mating Season, even though she's the lead. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with Lee Grant in Detective Story. I do want to go with Thelma Ritter a lot, but don't worry, we have more of her coming. Um, I'm picking for her. Me too. But Lee Grant um, in Detective Story, I want a movie to be ba- about her character. <laughs> um, she, like, she's um, always there, and there's a whole bunch of characters in this movie. Um, but she was the one out, like, every time she, like, was talking, I was like, yay, because she's so funny. Um, she offers these little sprinkles of humor throughout the serious movie as a shoplifter. And um, just the voice she puts on, too, like, people say to me, why don't you get married? Well, show me a guy and I'll marry him. Like, that kind of, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I, I, like, moments like that. Like, everything she said, I was laughing. I was having a good time when she was on screen. I think that's what, um, and clearly that's what they wanted to go for the film to go for and I mean talk about scene stealing because I was just always like well where's Lee during all of this uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go with Lee Grant as well like you said it would have been cool if we got a movie about her would have been cool if we got a movie about Thelma R- Ritter from the mating season oh no wait we did it was called <laughs> the mating season that's a good movie too well, anyway yeah <laughs> well let's talk about Lee so and like you said, her character is funny, and she's ditzy, and she offers these bright moments throughout a serious movie, and all the characters in this movie are interesting, and you would think, oh, well, then that means the silly one probably wouldn't be as interesting, but no, she is, and Lee had this part on stage, and yet she seems, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't seem like hackneyed, and it doesn't seem tired, it seems like, it does still feel like a real performance and a cinematic one at that. Um, and there, she, she's clearly this, like, love-starved woman, and, like, in, like, her first scene in the movie, like, every cop she talks to, she is clearly attracted to. Mm -hmm. Like, I I think it's her with Bert Freed, if I want to say, because she does it with a couple of cops, but there's one that she does, I want to say, with Bert Freed, where you're watching and you're like, wait, is she hitting on him? That's so weird. Like, who goes in for a police, you know, like, examination, gets arrested for, like, shoplifting, and then hits on the cop. It's just so weird. And, of course, the cops don't even really notice it, because they probably deal with stuff like that all the time. But it's, you know, it seems bizarre watching it, and yet it's not a bizarre character. It's a very, it, it feels like a real character. It feels like oh, this is that weird person that if I, for some reason, w- was in a police station, they would walk up and talk to me and I'd have to pretend like I cared. Like, you feel like, oh, we've all been around people like this in situations, like whether on the bus or on, you know, waiting in line for something. It's it's that sort of annoying character that just brings up their life problems to you and talks <laughs> about it. And it's perfectly embodied with Lee Grant's funny performance. 1952, the nominees are Gloria Graham for The Bad and the Beautiful, who won, Jean Hagen for Singing in the Rain, Colette Marchand for Moulin Rouge, Harry Moore for Come Back Little Sheba, and Thelma Ritter for With a Song in My Heart. I'm going to go with Jean Hagen, no surprise to Virginia. <laughs> this is, um, my life is 
um, pre seeing the rain, post seeing the rain. This is the film that changed it all for me. And the two people that made the biggest impressions when I saw this were Donald Connor and Jean Hagen. I thought she was hilarious with that voice she had that could shatter glass. And it's really a funny um, satire of silent film stars because obviously they didn't really sound like this, but this is taking it obviously to the extreme and it's hilarious. And her lines alone are great. The, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, bigger than Calvin Coolidge put together. <laughs> like that whole, like she's really dumb. Um, it really takes the dumb blonde character and makes it uh, eat twice as funny than other regular dumb blonde characters. I'm going to also pick Jean Hagen. I mean, she leaves such an impression in Singing in the Rain. And Singing in the Rain is such a classic, but I feel like one of everybody's favorite talking points with the movie is Jean Hagen. <laughs> I think people like to talk about, you know, make them laugh mm -hmm. and Jean Hagen's performance. Yeah. In those are, and they're the funniest parts of the movie. And she, it, I remember being surprised when I saw her in other movies and I found out she didn't talk like that and she didn't act like that. <laughs> she puts on such a, a blonde. Yeah, not even a blonde. Yeah. She puts on such a voice and she puts on such an act and she's so believable and she's so caught up in this characterization who is like who is a villainous but also is stupid and to the and funny and just a you can't best. hate her yeah you can't hate her she's such a comedic villainous that you enjoy every time she's on screen and more and rather than loving to hate her you just love having her around because she's that funny 1953 the nominees are grace kelly for magumbo Geraldine Page for Hondo, Marjorie Rambeau for Torch Song, Donna Reed who won for From Here to Eternity, and Thelma Ritter for Pick Up on South Street. Well, I'm finally going to go with Thelma Ritter. Um, Pick Up on South Street is an excellent movie, and everyone really lends their way to it. And Thelma Ritter is, we think of her as a comedic actress, which she is, and I'm glad she is, but um, this is her best dramatic work. Um, and probably her best work, actually, because you really feel for her. She could have easily been a character, the whole um, woman on the street who swindles for a living sort of thing, panhandle, or, um, but she makes her really human, and her death scene's really heartbreaking. She takes it on the chin, and it's um, a moment that you don't forget from this movie. Like, the, that and the opening scene are the best parts of this wonderful movie. I'm going to totally 100% agree with you. I'm picking Thelma Ritter as well. Pick Up on South Street is one of the best film noirs ever made. Mm -hmm. We both think so. It's classic Samuel Fuller. Mm -hmm. It's a great movie. And she is, and everyone is fantastic in this movie, but she's like the icing on top of the cake. Her character is a great um, character portrayal of a peddler, street peddler. But she's also, there's more to her than meets the eye. She does um, care about the characters we come to know, and she does. Um, and she is willing to um, put herself on the line for them, even though it doesn't really affect her. And like you said, she has a death scene in this movie that's really um, moving, and, but also um, relatable and real. And, real, and especially when it ties into this character, it fits in with her and who she is. And Thelma Ritter just totally, completely defines her. And like you said, she's mostly known for comedies, and this is her best dramatic work on camera. So, and it's something that it's amazing that next to all these splendid com comedic roles she did, this is able to stand alongside them as a classic. 1954, the nominees are Nina Fouch for Executive Suite, Katie Gerardo for Broken Lance, Eva Marie Saint, who won for On the Waterfront, Jan Sterling for The High and the Mighty, and Claire Trevor for The High and the Mighty. I'm going to go with Jan Sterling for The High and the Mighty. Um, I think she's the character that touched me the most when I saw this film. I really cared about her story of this woman who um, wants to have happiness. Um, and she's beautiful um, when she puts on makeup, but there's a scene where she takes it off and you realize she's not so beautiful. She's hiding behind makeup and, um, and so she's going to get married, but she hopes that to someone she only communicated through letters. And so she doesn't want him to be disappointed in her. So these, there's these little moments with her. They're very realistic. Um, and they're very moving. Um, and that's what, 
that was the shining beacon of um, the high and the mighty to me. This that was the great moment when she takes off her makeup. Um, I'm g gonna stick with the winner on this one. I guess it's the type of Eva Marie Saints character and on the waterfront could have easily been the girl. <laughs> and it, granted, she's not really written like mm -hmm. that. She's written, a, you know, more interesting than yeah. those type of girl characters, but I think she does take it one step above because she does have such great chemistry with Marlon Brando as Terry Malloy. And I think, and really what changes Marlon Brando to becoming like the hero of the movie is his relationship with this woman. And I feel like if she was um, fake or phony, we, we wouldn't believe it because the movie is his change and this character learning to do what is right and he learns to do what is right through her relationship with him but also she's also she's you know like the type of good girl but she's also uncomfortable around him like she likes him but at first she doesn't want to like him because she's uncomfortable around him why wouldn't she be he's this tough street guy and she's not like that at all so I think their relationship is very interesting in the movie, and it is such an important part of the movie. The movie takes a lot of time to really build up this relationship instead of just sort of throwing them together. Like, they're both attractive, like them, audience, <laughs> won't you? They literally have this relationship, and it's through her character and through her performance that Terry is able to really become a full-fledged character. 1955, the nominees are Betsy Blair and Marty. Peggy Lee in Pete Kelly's Blues, Marissa Pavan for The Rose Tattoo, Joe Van Flee who won for East of Eden, and Natalie Wood for Rebel Without a Cause. I'm going to agree with the winner, Joe Van Flee. I think she should have actually won for um, I'll Cry Tomorrow. Um, that I mean, I think that's the best she's ever been. Um, but East of Eden is also a very good triumph for her as well. I mean, it's kind of hard, I guess, shining when James Dean's around. Um, and then you also have Rainy Massey there too, so not easy, but she has a, plays a very interesting character, um, and the film opens with James Dean finally meeting his mother, Joan Van Flee, who is a prostitute, and it's, and she, her character isn't, again, it, someone who's not a character, she's a real woman, um, and you, um, get these glimpses of her, um, you know, being a real, per like, not being this tart, being, um, someone who kind of regrets what she did, but might as well, but, you know, has to accept it and, um, and has accepted it. She's on a pity party, so it's very interesting seeing this character. I think I'm going to pick Betsy Blair this year mm -hmm. for Marty, mainly because before I had the Oscars memorized, I now know without thinking, like, who won every year. But before I did, I always assumed she won. <laughs> I was always like, oh, well, Marty's here. Well, mm. obviously, Ernest and Betsy both won that year. And no, no, she didn't. But I think that, similar to why I picked even Marie Saint, her performance has to complement our lead performance. And our lead has to change through her and through their relationship that they have. And, you know, if she wasn't believable, then the whole relationship falls apart and it becomes fake. And since... and even more so in Marty than in On the Waterfront, although it, it, they are both the changing factors of the film, is the romance mm -hmm. and how that um, comes together and how that changes both characters and it gives them something both to live for. And uh, she, and like even Marie saying she's uncomfortable, but she is uncomfortable times 10 <laughs> in this. She's very awkward. And uh, like, I think it's relatable, like her yeah. at the dance, how uncomfortable she is and how like she's Alice even- Like Alice Adams. Yeah, like Alice Adams, like how she's even too uncomfortable to go up and talk to anybody and she's even uncomfortable when Marty's nice to her, but yeah, that's the type of character she is. It shows that she- it shows her who she is without going in- without talking. We, we know she doesn't go out much, we know she's uncomfortable around men, we know she probably never really dated anybody, and we know that just from her performance without her character even saying much. 1956, the nominees are Mildred Dunnick for Baby Doll, Eileen Heckert for The Bad Seed, Mercedes McCambridge for Giant, and P Patty McCormick for The Bad Seed, and the winner, Dorothy Malone, for Written on the Wind. I'm going to agree with the winner, Dorothy Malone. Um, I think um, of all these performances, she's the one that really steals the show. The other ones are great um, supporting parts, but um, and Patty McCormick and Eileen Heckert really share the screen, and The Bad Seed, I'm equally impressed by both of them. But Dorothy Malone, Red right on the Wind is her movie. I think her and Robert Stack are the well, that are the real key figures of this movie. They're what kept my interest. But Dorothy Malone really, really goes all out with the character. Um, someone who 
is in love with Brock Hudson. Oh, go figure. Um, <laughs> and she, um, but he doesn't notice her, so she takes it out by being with other men and by um, being kind of a girl around town. And it's really sad. It's pathetic. Um, and you feel bad for her. And you, but also she does these awful things too, because she will do anything to get him. So it, it's an incredibly interesting character. I'm going to go with the winner as well, Dorothy Malone. What could have been a trashy, bitchy character mm -hmm. is given a full-fledged treatment in Dorothy Malone's hands. Yeah. She is, I, I think, and I agree with you, her and Robert Stack are definitely the stealers of the film. They walk away with it. You can understand why they were made a couple more movies together after this, because they have a habit of, you know, they're both <laughs> such charismatic actors. But I think that... Um, it is one of those performances that you watch it and you can't help but think what it could have been, how mm -hmm. it could have just been. The... It should have been about her. Yeah, it should have been about her. Yeah, I would have watched that. And obviously they made movies in the future about characters kind of like this and focusing on characters like this. I guess she sort of popularized that. But, you know, you can't help but think, oh, this character could have been one-dimensional and this character just could have been this typical bitch that we don't care much about and that she just has this, you know, unrequited love, and you just say, well, get over it, he doesn't like you. Whereas with this character, you do want to say, okay, you probably should get over it, he clearly isn't interested, but you also can't see how empty her life is, and that she, you know, can't help but look for something that's not there, because her life is just so empty, and she really just makes this character something extra special. 1957. The nominees are Carolyn Jones for The Bachelor Party, Elsa Lanchester for Witness for the Prosecution, Hope Lang for Peyton Place, Miyoshi Umeki for Sayonara, who won, and Diane Barsi for Peyton Place. I'm going to agree with the winner, Miyoshi Umeki, um, and I picked Red Buttons, too, for Best Supporting Actor, because, like I said, they were my favorite parts of the film. I thought their relationship was very realistic, and it wasn't schmaltzy. Um, and yet it was very romantic. Um, they really underplay it incredibly well. They add dignity and maturity to this romance, and your heart really goes out to them because it is a pretty forbidden romance, but they're, they're not hurting anyone. They love each other, and you really see that brought out by them. You really get mad about people's prejudice because, I mean, aside from it just being prejudiced, you get mad because it threatens them, this happy couple. I think, I think I'm going to go with Hope Lang for mm. Pain in Place. She was your runner-up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that she, her um, performance could have easily been melodramatic, mm -hmm. could have easily been soap opery, and the movie is kind of like that, but in a good way, in the best way possible. Absolutely. Yeah, but um, I think she doesn't, she do doesn't go down that path. I feel like some of the actors in the movie do, and that's fine, but she doesn't. She plays it probably the most realistically, um, and she plays it. She keeps her character consistent. She is emotional, but not over-emotional, and she is um, awkward, and she is um, uncomfortable, but she is also charming and likable. Mm -hmm. And I think she is one of those characters that watching it, you're, you do think, oh, well, the movie could have been about her. I would have yeah. watched that. <laughs> and again, like with Dorothy Malone, there were movies in the future about a character like this, and you can totally see why they did that, because this character is so memorable. And when I think of Pain and Play, she's the first thing I think of. I think she's probably the standout of the movie, mm -hmm. and that's saying something, because everyone in this movie mm -hmm. does a good job mm -hmm. in some way. Or um, even, like, the people who the Oscars didn't recognize were in this movie and, like, supporting roles were very good. But I think that I, I feel like when I think of the movie, she is the first part of it I do think of. Um, 1958, the nominees are Peggy Cass and Auntie Mame, Wendy Hiller, who won for Separate Tables, Martha Heyer for Some Came Running, Maureen Stapleton for Lonely Hearts, and Kara Williams for The Defiant Ones. I'm going to go with Piggy Cast and Auntie Mame. This is such a hilarious part. Um, how I mean, we quote her all the time, actually. <laughs> um, we quote this movie all the time in general, but um, talk about really a standout comedic performance of Agnes Gooch. Um, and the name alone describes <laughs> the type of character she is, the um, really mousy secretary 
um, who's really awkward, and yet she goes out and lives. <laughs> um, and the voice that Peggy Cass puts on, it's a remarkably hilarious performance. Um, and I remember just the first time I saw it, I was cracking up, and it still makes me laugh to this day. And I've seen this movie how many times? I mean, it's one of my favorite movies, actually. And um, and it's the performances of Rosalind Russell and Peggy Cass that really just keep coming back again and again and again. I'm going to pick her as well, and it it is such a funny performance. She probably steals every scene she's yeah. in. That's how funny it is. And her character, like you said, the name describes her. And right when we see her, she's a, she just stands out because she's so, uh, she seems so strict and like nerdy and, you know, in that first scene, I'm your sponge. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, her performance just gets funnier and funnier as the movie mm -hmm, goes along, and in the climax, she's hilarious, mm -hmm. and I mean, like you said, it, it's like, she gives one of the most quotable performances in in the film, and it's, you would think it would be so difficult for any character to stand up next to Auntie Bane, just this bright, funny, larger-than-life character, and yet, this, the character of Agnes Scooch does, and Peggy Cass's performance does, and it is... You know, it makes you laugh every time she says anything, mm -hmm. and that is something special. 1959, the nominees are Hermione Baddeley for Room at the Top, Susan Conner for Imitation of Life, Juanita Moore for Imitation of Life, Thelma Ritter for Pillow Talk, and the winner Shelley Winters for The Diary of Anne Frank. And I've written a blog on Susan Conner in their estate. I think she should have won. Um, the, the, really, the heart and soul of Imitation of Life is Susan Conner. Um, this film works. It's um, so believable because of Susan Connor, and she plays um, a light-skinned African American girl. And Susan Connor was not African American at all. Um, she was half Hispanic, um, but you know, you you. Um, but she, yeah, she's supposed to not look African American. And I guess today, you know, you we consider that white whitewashing. Keep in mind, this was the fifties. But she really brings such dignity to this character. Um, such, uh, I mean, you understand her, like, because even though she could have easily been bratty, because she is, um, embarrassed by her mother, um, you understand her. I mean, yeah, she's a bit bratty, but, you know, you're like, oh, but I understand if you could get out of that life of being, um, of being always repressed, then wouldn't you want to do it? So it's really a tragic yet, um, heartfelt performance. This year, the two... The two people, neck and neck, is, are clearly from the same movie. They're um, Susan Connor and Juanita Moore, mm -hmm. and it's, to me, it's very difficult to pick between yeah. the two of them, it, especially since they both complement each other so mm -hmm. well on screen. I think maybe just by an inch, I'm gonna go with Juanita mm -hmm. Moore, and maybe okay. just to pick somebody different <laughs> from you, but uh, I think that it, and also because we do have, we've seen performances of what this could have been, and we've seen in the other performance, I mean, Louise Beavers is a great actress, and we see the type of performance she was forced to put on mm -hmm. in the original, how she had to put on that voice, mm -hmm. and, you know, it just, it make it cheapens this, the deep relationship a little bit, whereas this one doesn't, equal and, footing. yeah, equal footing, and how she, and she plays her character like she accepts where she is in society, but she also is uncomfortable with it because she has to explain it to her daughter, like, this is all you can expect for, you know, being a, a black person in America, and it's heartbreaking, and her performance is heartbreaking, but she also knows that she, for herself, can't make a big deal out of it, and that she has, and her relationship with Lana Turner is so interesting, like how uh, Lana Turner will say, like, oh, wow, you do something like this? Why didn't, why didn't I ever hear about it? And she said, well, you never asked me. Like, when she, you know, she's even uncomfortable just talking about herself in front of her, because she... To her friend. Yeah, to her friend, because in her mind, they are on equal footing. Of course, Lana doesn't think much of this. How, how would she? But to Juanita, she obviously, even in somebody who's her best friend, she can't have that type of relationship, because in her mind, she knows that they're not on equal footing. And she never goes over the top of this performance like Susan Connor and their scenes together are, you know, the best part of the movie. They're wonderful. 1960, the nominees are Glynis Johns for The Sundowners, Shirley Jones, who won for Elmer Gantry, Shirley Knight for The Dark at the Top of the Stairs, Janet Lee 
for Psycho and marry your for sons and lovers. I'm going to go with kind of the obvious one, <clears throat> Janet Lee and Psycho. <clears throat> I'm really, um, one of the, probably the great performances of horror. I mean, I, it kind of upsets me when I watch horror movies and the leading, and like the girl doesn't really commit to it. Yeah. Really, um, she like lets out a whippy scream, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause, um, you know, you don't want to think I could do better than that. Um, and <laughs> we're from the Faye Ray. We're the, you know, we watch Faye Ray. We're yeah. used to people giving their whole attitude in the yeah, stream. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I really like that Janet Lee really commits to this part and she plays it with such, um, with, um, really a double-sided woman, a woman who, um, will, is willing to, um, embezzle for, um, for happiness. Um, so it's really an interesting, because at first you think the film's gonna be about her, and you're interested in that part of the film, too. Um, and then you realize just some, something way more darker is ahead. But, um, J but Janet Lee is really, um, quite charming in some parts, as she often is, and yet she's willing to fully commit to this role. The two people to pick between are Janet Lee and Shirley Jones, mm -hmm. for me. So it's difficult to pick between them. I think just for the character, I'm going to go with Shirley Jones, mm -hmm. because Shirley Jones has such a complicated character to play, and yeah. so does Janet Lee. But Shirley Jones really has to, like, she's the type of character that at first when we see her, we think we have her all figured out. Mm -hmm. And then we realize, oh, there's way more to her than, you know, we thought. Like, and you feel kind of bad for assuming that, actually. <laughs> and I think that, um, it's, I think it's also because, similar with Janet Lee, but in Shirley Jones' performance, you know, we're used to her in Oklahoma and as Mrs. Partridge. So seeing her as a prostitute with revenge on her mind is something you wouldn't ever expect her to do and to see her fully be commit to the role and totally get into it is entertaining and i think the scene that i always that i'm always going to remember from the movie in elmer gantry is the scene where um it's where she feels bad about what she did to elmer and uh her her pimp is yelling at her saying like what are you in love with him or something and she kind of is and she, how she you see this character completely change and how she does feel bad and that there is more to her than that meets the eye and I mean it's an emotional emotional scene and it really is probably the most emotional moment in the film 1961 the nominees are Faye Banter for The Children's Hour Judy Garland for Judgment at Nuremberg Lottie Lania for the Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone, Una Merkel for Summer and Smoke, and the winner Rita Marino for West Side Story. It's a really good group. <laughs> I'm gonna go with Una Merkel and Summer and Smoke. Um, I, Una Merkel never ceases to enter, never, I mean, she's so entertaining, yeah. always, yeah. always. Um, and this one, she really does, <laughs> um, have a really juicy role. This is the mother that you, it would be such an embarrassment to have. She is mentally, um, she's mentally not there anymore. And she really, um, and so when she finds, she knows that her daughter Geraldine Page is in love with the boy next door, Lawrence Harvey, um, even though, like, he never even think, like, thinks twice about her. And so one part, like, when he's over, she, like, just says, oh, she's in love with you. Like, you know, she says stuff like that when people are over, and you are just, like, so embarrassed for this girl. Um, and yet, Una Merkel, she doesn't know what she's saying either. Like, um, so it's really one of those performances you have to see to really relish in it, because it's a, it's a really entertaining film and a very entertaining performance. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, gonna go with Judy Garland this year. Yeah, she was your runner-up, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that, uh, kind of like with Shirley Jones, who would think, you know, Judy Garland could pull off such dramatic performances, but yeah, in the last few years of her life, from basically from A Star is Born on up, she proved that she could do that, you know, mm -hmm. as better than anybody, better than most other people. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that her performance in this is like Montgomery Clift, like mm -hmm. how it is, like, you know, a supporting performance, and it does you have to wait for it to come on, but once it does, you know, you feel like you're being treated to something special. And like with Montgomery Cliff, she puts on a, an accent and a voice, and she's almost <clears throat> unrecognizable mm -hmm. in this character she's playing, in this real character she's playing, about how she is talking about, you know, being younger and having a relationship with a Nazi, um, and how 
it's like you know sort of like the turning point in the trial and it's where you almost like the kind of like with Montgomery Cliff like the human aspect comes into this um disturbing trial and the the side of where it's more than just the side of war that is part of that is on trial here and I think that it's it is ama it is amazing that you know a singer can pull off such a great performance and she like Frank Sinatra proved that comedy were drama they can do it. 1962, the nominees are Mary Badham for To Kill a Mockingbird, Patty Duke who won for The Miracle Worker, Shirley Knight for Sweet Bird of Youth, Angela Lansbury for The Manchurian Candidate, and Thelma Ritter for Birdman of Alcatraz. Um, I definitely can see why Patty Duke won, and I have no problem with her winning, but you know where I'm going with this. Um, Angela Lansbury, I think, should have won. Um, this is the tour de force of her career on film. Um, she plays the manipulative mother of Lawrence Harvey, and just all out an awful, awful woman, not one kind side to her. She's willing to do anything to, for her husband to get into office, even exploiting her son's condition and brainwashing that she discovers he has. So it's an incredibly interesting um, tale, a moment of this espionage film, and um, the best part of the entire film actually is her, and just her stoic yet also evil and snarky performance. I'm also going to pick Angela Lansbury, obviously she's the obvious one to, mm -hmm. to pick, even though, yeah, Patty Duke is good. and. Mm -hmm. the her Oscar-winning performance, it is clearly Angela Lansbury who yeah. should have taken home the gold for such a um, uh, unsympathetic character and mm -hmm. such a ruthless portrayal. I think that it's it's definitely one of the best in the domineering mother category of mm -hmm. all portrayals. And when Meryl Streep couldn't do better than you know, at this, then that's something, mm -hmm. isn't it? That remake sucked anyway. <laughs> I could talk about how bad that was forever. Well, anyway, we can... so that this performance is, like you said, probably the highlight of the movie and such an excellent movie with brilliant performances all around and, you know, exciting moments. And yet it is her scenes that stand out and especially the scene where she, you see her um, telling Lawrence Harvey that she wants him him to murder their political opponent mm -hmm. and she's talking about how she asked for an assassin and she said i didn't know they were gonna send you but now you gotta do it type of thing and not even the fact that her son is involved in this can get her to stop she's still that determined to win for 1963 the nominees are diane calento for tom jones dame edith evans for tom jones joyce redman for tom jones Margaret Rutherford, who won for the VIPs, and Lilia Scala for Lilies of the Field. I'm going to go with Dame Edith Evans. I mean, a lot of women were nominated, mm -hmm. as you can hear, were nominated for Tom Jones. Um, but I think she, like Hugh Griffith, really add a spice to this funny mm -hmm. film. And they're very funny. They are mm -hmm. naturally funny actors. Um, e even though, like, they're very respected actors, they're also very funny. And um, I think she's the quintessential a petite British lady, <laughs> um, as she often is in her films, but it's very entertaining. It adds um, the British sense of humor to this film that is um, full of it. And she's and she's not in like too much of it because um, she's really at the beginning and the end, but I, I found her quite memorable and pretty damn funny. I'm going to pick Willia Scala for mm -hmm. um, uh, Lows of the Field, where she's the head nun in this, and her performance and it's is such an amusing performance mm -hmm. kind of like Sydney Poitiers in this but for completely different reasons because yeah. she is completely stoic and she is completely determined she wants a chapel more than anything else in mm -hmm. the world and of course being a nun that would be her mission she would have uh, a yearning for that and how she is willing to walk for miles in the hot sun to go to mass because they don't have a chapel but when and how <laughs> she also is tries to, like, rap Cindy Poitier, who is, like, this, you know, guy who just wanders around around her finger and trying to get him to do what she wants. It's fun. It is funny. But also how s serious she is throughout the whole movie until the ending when we see her just break a little bit when uh, Sydney leaves and it shows that she really does like having him around, even though, yeah, they, like, it's the type of relationship where they get on each other's nerves, but there is a respect and a, you know, 
true like almost friendship between mm-hmm. them so when he does leap at the end she is you see her like moved by it and you know being a nun obviously she can't have much emotions but she has emotion in that one moment and it is you know it really caps off the main relationship in this film 1964 the nominees are gladys cooper for my fair lady dame edith evans for the chalk garden grayson hall for the knight of the iguana Lila Kedrova, who won for Zorba the Greek, and Agnes Moorhead for Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. I'm gonna go with Grayson Hall and The Night of the Iguana. Um, this is a movie um, where everybody is quite good. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a film that requires the actors to be good, and the Tennessee Williams play what you expect. <laughs> um, and her character is incredibly interesting she's a lesbian but she doesn't even know she's a lesbian she won't even think about it and Mm -hmm. Ava Gardner catches on to it but she won't it's it's very interesting because she takes on this um interest in um oh damn Lolita (laughs) (laughs) to Lion to Lion um and yeah sorry um and um and at first you think it's quite motherly but then you realize this this isn't normal but she does and like I said she won't let herself um, know it. So to her, she's just being completely a completely responsible woman. Like she doesn't want her being with young men because it's not right. <laughs> but in reality, there's something else here. So it's quite interesting seeing this woman play this character and really pull it off to a point where you really believe it. it when Ava Gardner, she, Ava Gardner's not pulling out of air, like pulling something out of thin air, like saying, "Oh, you're you're a lesbian." Like no, yeah. um, she is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That confrontation scene at the end is, is interesting. I think Ava Gardner should have been nominated. So. I agree, Ava Gardner should have been nominated. I'll go with. I, I suppose I'm going to go with the winner on this, mm-hmm. although everybody's pretty good this year. Yeah. I think that. Um, so I think that it's the type of performance that is kind of her own world, and she is completely out of it throughout the whole movie. Like she doesn't realize that she's like this age prostitute, and there's like. Uh, there's a scene where she's talking about um like this story that she has like from her memories and Alan Bates just breaks out laughing and and um because it sounds so ridiculous and so hackneyed and like you know something somebody would make up and she's like oh my gosh are you laughing at me and if any quotes like no we wouldn't do that <laughs> like and so and I think that um in her whole character, you know, she thinks Zorba is, like, in love with her when really he just sleeps with her because she's there. <laughs> like, he has no feelings for this woman. But she is completely, she's that far out of reality that she thinks, oh, of course he loves me. It's not just because I'm a hooker. <laughs> and I think that um, there's also a memorable, she also has a memorable death scene in this movie that is, like, very uncomfortable to watch. 1965, the final year, the nominees are Ruth Gordon for Inside Daisy Clover, Joyce Redman for Othello, Maggie Smith for Othello, Shelley Winters who won for A Patch of Blue, and Peggy Wood for The Sound of Music. I'm going to agree with the winner, Shelley Winters, um, the mother from hell <laughs> in, the, in A Patch of Blue. This is the kind of part that really Shelley Winters, like, is, this is a Shelley Winters part, true and true. Um, and she's a very abusive mother. She's um, very intolerant. Um, and she's a prostitute, um, and doesn't care about the safety or the well-being of her blind daughter. And you think, you know, be, her daughter being blind, she would. No. Um, and the final scene, um, um, one of the, the final scene with her is when she's trying to get her daughter back from Sydney Poitier and finds that nobody's on her side, like, in the park. Like, you know, she says, take him, he's taking my daughter, but nobody wants, like, they see right through They see her abusing her daughter in public, um, and they, they know why the daughter's trying to go away. So, and so it's kind of, uh, um, so it's, like, totally whiplash moment, like, where she suddenly, like, wants to be the nice mother, like, too little too late, honey. Um, so, yeah, it's a very entertaining part. I'm also gonna go with the winner on this, Shelley Winters in A Patch of Blue, and it's yet another domineering mother part. We've picked quite a number <laughs> of those, and this is, yeah, this one like a lot of the others we picked, has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. She's awful and you wouldn't want to even know her. You wouldn't Mm -hmm. want to be around her. Mm -hmm. And she is, um, the way she pushes her daughter around, the way she pushes everyone around, Mm -hmm. in that she wouldn't even let her daughter have a life. And once she has a life, she doesn't want her to to have that. 
and she like you said she's the mother from hell she there this is such an awful character and i feel like most actors would be uncomfortable in this and they would seem un a little uncomfortable in this but she completely throws herself mm -hmm. into this role as shelly winters only could she only <laughs> always could throw her whole you know being into yeah. a part and this is her at her nastiness mm -hmm. her nastiest and it's one of the i think just one of those notable awful mother roles that have defined <laughs> cinema in the villainous <laughs> category for a long time. Okay, so before we go, we're for our recommendations this week, I don't have I don't have any for the weekend. Bianca has two that played earlier today. It's through it's through I guess her own fault that we couldn't put this out mm -hmm. earlier, but if she would want to, she can read her two she can read her suggestions. <laughs> well maybe she DVR'd them. Um <laughs> Uh, well, what are they? Well, one sec. I'm just looking up something. Okay, wait, she's looking up something. Uh, okay, there. <laughs> um, well, there's a story of Louis Pester and Abe Lincoln in Illinois. If you DVR these, they're both excellent films um, with excellent lead performances. All right, well, we're going to see you next week. Even though it's the end of Oscar month, we're going to do a little um, bonus round where we're going <laughs> to talk about Best Picture. going to definitely be the toughest one. Absolutely. And, uh, I was even just looking through some years, mm. and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to pick. It's going to probably be in the heat of the moment. I'm going to have to pick mm -hmm. some of them. And, but it should be, um, we're probably going to be pulling our hair out, and it's going to be, um, like, picking between children, but it's all right. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see you then.